Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime and makeup video where I'm gonna be talking about a true crime case and doing my makeup at the same time. And every single product that I'm gonna be using on my face today will be in the description box down below. So today's case is the story of Isabella Guzman, who is now infamous after videos of her went viral on TikTok. There was just this really weird trend where people would imitate um, Isabella's court appearance. There were some people dressing up in the orange jumpsuit. There was people copying her facial expressions. And it was because of her facial expressions why this case went so viral on TikTok. And it, it was just, it's just weird. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. It was just weird. I feel like I'm gonna say weird a lot in this video, but Isabella wasn't in court for just some low level petty crime. She was making an appearance in court because she was being charged with first degree murder. It's quite common on TikTok for people to duet videos and like copy each other's videos and stuff. But this was not like some funny little dance trend that was going on. Uh, this was murder. I mean, the behavior that Isabella was showing in the court appearance was very bizarre. I've got to admit it was. The facial expressions, um, not what you would expect to see from someone appearing in court for first degree murder. And it's definitely her facial expressions, her behavior in court, which is what has fascinated so many people. I mean, you wouldn't really expect someone to react like that after they've just murdered someone. I can't even believe I'm saying this, but I think the weirdest thing, not that I haven't already said very weird things, was there was so much emphasis on her appearance. Pain, almost like a cult-like following because of the way she looked. It's like people thought that she was too pretty to be a murderer, which I don't know how people link those two. I don't know how people think that because of the way you look on the outside dictates who you are on the inside and what you're capable of. Um, but this was happening in the case of Isabella Guzman. People were so almost obsessed with the way she looked, saying she was so cute, saying she was so pretty. And the kinds of comments on these videos on TikTok, people were saying, oh, I have a crush on her. Um, okay. And she's so cute. She's so pretty. She can't be capable of this. And I think those most disturbing comments, and I did see this more than once, it wasn't just one person, people saying that whoever she murdered deserved it. Um, it makes me lose faith in humanity when I see comments like that. And as well, there's more, there's more weird, bizarre things with these TikTok videos. In a lot of these videos, I would say most of them, not all, but most of them had the song Sweet But Psycho playing in the background, which in itself is um, a very controversial song that stigmatizes mental health. But to put that song over the videos of Isabella Guzman, to almost romanticize the whole situation, just takes it to another level. I mean, I just think it's just so disgusting that people romanticize these kinds of crimes and these kinds of criminals. And unfortunately, it's not uncommon. We have seen it happen before with people like Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez, Chris Watts. People seem to think that the way somebody looks almost diminishes the gravity of their crimes. And in some cases, because of the way they look, People believe that they should be treated more leniently and that is on pretty privilege. But of course, behind all of these viral videos, behind all of these people romanticizing Isabella, there was a brutal murder, a complete tragedy that should not be glamorized in any way, shape or form. So today I'm gonna to give you the true story on what actually happened in the case of Isabella Guzman. Um, so yeah. Let's just uh, jump straight in. So Isabella Guzman was born on the 9th of June, 1995, making her a Gemini. She was born in Aurora, Colorado. She parents Yumi Hoy and Robert Guzman. And when Isabella was just four years old, her parents did divorce. I don't know why they divorced. Uh, all I could find was that there was a misunderstanding. And her mother shortly after remarried to a man called Ryan Hoy. And her mother remarrying did seem to be the trigger of what would be a very troubled relationship between the mother and the daughter. Isabella just didn't seem to accept that her mom had moved on, which of course is not uncommon for children when their parents have separated. I don't know exactly the age of Isabella when her mother did remarry, but I know when she was 
was seven years old. Things at home weren't going well at all and Isabella did move in with her biological father. Just because things have become so difficult in the home and Yumi just couldn't cope. There isn't really much information um, on Isabella's childhood. However, we do know that she was raised as a Jehovah's Witness, which is a specific branch of Christianity. And from what I could find out, her mother, Yumi, her father, Robert, and her stepfather, Ryan, were also Jehovah's Witnesses. And Isabella, at the age of 14, decided that she wanted to leave the religion. And in some cases, from what I've read, it's not as straightforward to leave the Jehovah's Witness religion. And this issue of her wanting to leave the religion does come up later in the video, but this um, definitely caused problems between Isabella and Yumi. So it's 2013 now and Isabella is 18 and this is when her behavior gets even worse and tensions between Yumi and Isabella just increase. And what added to the tension in the household is Isabella wanted to drop out of school. She was so close to graduating and I can obviously understand why this caused tension because she was so close to graduating. There was also issues with Isabella sneaking boys into the house. And there was an incident where a neighbor had to call the police because there was just men jumping over the fence, which did end up being Isabella's boyfriends. And there was actually a little incident with one of her boyfriends. So in late August, 2013, she broke up with her boyfriend. Again, I don't know the reasons why she broke up with him, but he came over to her house because he'd left some of his things there and he went over to pick them up and she chased after him with a golf club. Um, yeah, I don't know why they broke up. I don't know what happened there, but she chased after him with a golf club. Around this time as well, she was becoming a lot more disrespectful and a lot more threatening towards her mom and her stepdad. The stepdad, Ryan, said that Yumi and Isabella did clash often. I don't know if their personalities just didn't mesh well together, but they did clash often. But what was going on in August 2013 was just on another level. It was very out of character for Isabella and it just felt different, the disrespect and the aggressive behavior. It just felt different this time. It got so bad that during one argument between Isabella and Yumi, Isabella actually spat on her mom, which she had never done before. And this incident was kind of what really scared Yumi. It really shook her and she was that scared that she asked Ryan if he could stay in the same bed as her because she was so scared of Isabella and she just didn't know what could possibly happen. I can't even imagine um, being scared of your children. That must have been really, really horrible and traumatic. So the very next day, the day after Isabella spat in her mom's face, we are now on the 28th of August, 2013. This is the day that everything came to a head. And unfortunately, this is the day that the terrible events of this case take place. When Yumi woke up that morning, she awoke to a threatening email from Isabella and it said something along the lines of, you will pay. I don't really know the context of that email. I don't know what Isabella is claiming that her mother will pay for, but Yumi is freaking out at this point. She is already scared of Isabella and she's like, what do I do? Like, I can't even imagine, like Isabella is her daughter and she's physically scared of her. She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know what the right thing to do is in this situation. And Yumi realized that she was probably gonna have to call the police, but she didn't want to. I think we can all understand that. Um, but she did end up calling the police because she was so scared. Um, and she was just hoping that maybe the police could almost knock some sense into Isabella. So the police came out, they performed a welfare check and the police try and calm the situation down and they talk to Isabella and they tell Isabella, Isabella, you're 18 now, like your mom can legally kick you out. So you should change your behavior because obviously you don't want to get kicked out. And I think the police were like just trying to scare her, but um, <laughs> that would definitely work for me. So this all happened on the morning of August the 28th. And then after the police went, Yumi went to work and when she was at work she phoned Isabella's biological father Robert and asked for his help as well. She asked him if he could also go over maybe talk to Isabella just kind of have that like little sit down conversation with her because I can imagine that Yumi was doing that as well but there was just so much tension between Yumi and Isabella. Isabella just wasn't listening to her mother at all um, and I can imagine she wasn't really listening to her stepdad either because there was obviously tension there. Um, so Yumi turned to her father Robert to just try and help the situation. So 
the afternoon of August the 28th, Robert went over to see his daughter. He sat her down. He tried to like really press on her the importance of showing your parents respect and that she should just try and listen more to her mother. Just everything should just calm down. We should all speak like adults. And Robert thought that this talk was going really, really well because everything that he was saying, Isabella was like nodding and agreeing to. So Robert thought that this talk was going super well. And he left after this talk thinking that he'd made some progress and that he'd gone through to Isabella and everything would be great. Um, but I think it's clear from what is about to happen in this case that Isabella didn't agree with her father at all. It seemed like even though she was agreeing to everything that her father said, um, she was probably just agreeing to end the conversation. I think we've all been in conversations like that where we're just agreeing with the person because we want them to shut up. I think that this can apply to the conversation that Isabella had with her father. So after her father left, Isabella returned to her bedroom and that is where she stayed for pretty much the rest of the evening. So later on in the evening, Yumi returns home from work around 9.30, she returns home with a McDonald's and Ryan is just in the living room and she asks him, where's Isabella? Where is she? And Ryan says that he hasn't really seen her all evening. He saw her about an hour ago, but she's just in her room. So Yumi decides that she's just gonna go take a shower. She leaves Ryan downstairs. He's eating his McDonald's. However, a few minutes after Yumi went to take a shower, Ryan starts hearing thumping noises and his wife is calling out his name. Obviously completely concerned, he runs upstairs, he sees the bathroom, the door is open and the shower is running, which he immediately thinks is so strange because it's like Yumi should be in the shower and the door would be shut. And then he sees Isabella in the bathroom, just stood there and she closes that bathroom door with Yumi still inside and Ryan rushes to that door. He tries to get in before Isabella can lock the door. However, Isabella overpowers Ryan and locks the door with just her and Yumi inside that bathroom. Now, immediately after Isabella manages to lock the door, Ryan hears so much commotion coming from the bathroom. His wife is screaming and Ryan runs downstairs, grabs his phone, phones the police. And then when he returns back upstairs, there is a pool of blood coming from underneath the bathroom door. Yumi is still in the bathroom and she is screaming and she manages to say one last word, Jehovah, before everything goes quiet. So Ryan is stood outside the bathroom door and the bathroom door unlocks, the door opens and Isabella is just stood there wearing a pink sports bra, turquoise colored shorts, covered in blood and in her right hand, she's holding a knife in a downwards pointing position and blood is dripping off this knife. She then walks towards Ryan silently and Ryan is freaking out at this point. At this point, he doesn't have a clue what has happened to Yumi. He doesn't know what is about to happen to him, but Isabella just walks straight past him. She doesn't even look at him. She doesn't make eye contact. She's just staring straight ahead as if she can't see him. So Ryan rushes to the bathroom and he finds Yumi on the floor with a baseball bat lying next to her. And at this point, he's still on the phone to the 911 operator who instructs him to perform CPR to see if he can do anything because she's not breathing. I can't even imagine how traumatic that would have been for Ryan trying to perform CPR. And Yumi is completely covered in blood her eyes are just open and blank and staring at the ceiling. The emergency services arrive at 10, 16 p.m., just 11 minutes after Ryan made that call. 11 minutes. All of this happened in such a short space of time. And when the emergency services arrived, they tried to perform CPR on Yumi as well. And very sadly, she was pronounced dead at 10, 28 p.m. on the 28th of August, which was only an hour after she arrived home from work. Remember she arrived home from work at half nine and she was pronounced dead an hour later. The autopsy showed that Yumi had been stabbed a total of 79 times in both the face and the neck. Like this is where all of her injuries were. 
and she also had a slit to the throat. It is thought that the attack had started with the baseball bat that was found next to Yumi in the bathroom and it's thought that Isabella started with the baseball bat to weaken her mom and then she moved on to the knife and that is where she proceeded to stab her mom 79 times. And I saw a lot of comments almost judging Ryan because Isabella overpowered him and he didn't break down the bathroom door. And I just wanna say it's really easy to judge and speculate after the events have happened. At the end of the day, none of us were there. We cannot say what we would or wouldn't have done in a situation like that. I don't think anyone truly knows how they're gonna react in a situation like that. So I just think it's really easy to judge in hindsight. And also you've got to maybe bear in mind Ryan has said that all of the aggressive behavior that Isabella was showing was very out of character for her. Would his mind really have automatically immediately gone to, oh my God, Isabella is going to murder her mom. But I think it is plausible to think that his mind didn't automatically go to murder. Clearly there was some kind of commotion, physical fight going on. Obviously this is all just speculation. We don't have a clue what happened. We don't know what was going on in Ryan's mind, but I just wanted to put that out there because I was just seeing a lot of almost blaming Ryan for the murder. Like if he was man enough, he would have been able to overpower Isabella because she was a little girl. And uh, I just wanna say, can we stop with that kind of narrative because it's not needed anywhere today, tomorrow, or any other day after that. So police want to find Isabella immediately because obviously um, she's just killed someone and she's not in the house. She's nowhere to be found. And Ryan said that he thinks that she fled into the backyard and God knows where she is from there. So the police go into the backyard, they search everywhere, they can't find her. So they release her images to the public. They say that she's dangerous, like do not approach her. I mean, she's on the loose right now. She's just murdered someone and she's on the loose with the knife. And the police are searching all around the home, but they can't find her. There is no sign of her anywhere. They also try to track her cell phone as well. Um, but Isabella has turned that off. So they can't even do that to try and find where she is. So the next day, August the 29th, a member of the public calls into the police and reports that they think they found a dead body because there is a body in a car that is completely covered in blood. So the police go out to where this car is. It's in a local car park, but the body has gone. And I don't know if at this point the police figure out that this is in connection to Isabella Guzman because obviously they're the police, they get reports on all sorts. So I don't know if they uh, suspect that this has anything to do with Isabella right now, but they search the car and they find some of the items belonging to Isabella. So then they figure out, oh, the dead body is obviously not a dead body. It was just Isabella asleep in this car. And Isabella, as we know, was covered in her mom's blood. So that must be what the member of the public thought was a dead body. So the police start a manhunt and they know that she's on foot because her car is obviously still in this car park. So they know that she must not have gone far. And she is actually spotted just outside of the car park around 2 p.m. So the police close in on the 29th of August and they arrest Isabella Guzman for murder. So a week after her arrest is when Isabella made her now infamous court appearance. She had to attend court to be formally charged with her crimes. And Isabella was actually kicking up a fuss before this court appearance, like she was refusing to leave her cell. And the whole court hearing was actually delayed by quite a bit. But when Isabella eventually arrived in court, that is when she displayed uh, that bizarre behavior that we have seen now. And it is that behavior that recently resurfaced and went viral on TikTok. And it's now what makes Isabella and this case so infamous. You can see her as soon as she enters the court, she catches the camera and she almost does like this smirk kind of look. And then there's a later point where she just stares dead on the camera, like with no emotion at all. And then she does this weird thing where she points to her eyes. And I don't know why she does this. There is speculation that she points to her eyes to show that she's not crying. Um, I don't know where people have gotten that from because uh, I tried to find out if that actually was what she was doing, uh, but I couldn't confirm that at all. So we can only speculate as well. Bear in mind, this court appearance is only a week after she murdered her mom. So this is all completely fresh right now. And obviously because of what she's done and the environment, this behavior is obviously completely inappropriate. However, when I saw the clips of uh, Isabella, I just saw her behavior as very childlike. 
um, it's like she doesn't quite grasp what is going on and the gravity of what's going on, which is kind of a childlike response to a situation like this. It seems like she's just messing around with friends. Um, if you know what I mean, like, for example, how many times has a friend or a family member pulled out a camera, a phone on you and you've pulled like a face um, because you don't want to be on camera or for whatever reason? Like, how many times have you done that? Because I know that I've done that numerous times. And that to me is exactly what Isabella is doing. She spots the camera and she pulls a funny face as if she's messing around with friends, which is obviously completely normal like that behavior, but in a courtroom after murder, that is what makes this behavior completely bizarre and inappropriate. And I know that Isabella was 18 at the time that she murdered her mother. So she is technically an adult, um, but it just seems like a very childlike response to the whole situation, if I'm being completely honest. And uh, we saw a situation like that actually in The Twilight Killers, which was a case that I recently covered. There are also a few things as well that come out later on that also may explain why she was behaving the way she was. So Isabella is being detained without bond as well. I probably should have said that. So she's currently being detained and it is now 2014, almost a year after she murdered her mom and her court date is approaching. So because Isabella was being tried as an adult um, and she was being charged with first degree murder, the prosecution could actually push for the death penalty in this case. However, before the trial started, the defense submitted a plea of insanity and asked if Isabella could be found not guilty due to reasons of insanity. Isabella had recently undergone a medical analysis and had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. It is thought that in the days leading up to the murder of Yumi, Isabella's mental state was deteriorating rapidly and about a month or so before the murder, Isabella had started to hear voices and she was imagining characters that weren't real. Remember the boyfriend that she chased with a golf club? Well, he said that this was completely out of her character. Like she had never displayed anything like this before. And Isabella also was talking about someone called Sam to her boyfriend, um, saying that Sam hated her boyfriend and her boyfriend didn't have a clue who this Sam person was. They just came out of nowhere. And he thinks that this Sam person, this character wasn't even real. She had also started to call her mom Cecilia, which obviously wasn't her name. And Isabella had started to believe that her mom was this Cecilia person and she needed to kill Cecilia in order to save the world. And it was because of all of this, the prosecution decided that Isabella could could not have been in the right state of mind when she murdered her mom. And both the prosecution and the judge accepted the plea of insanity. Therefore, Isabella was found not guilty by reasons of insanity and she didn't receive a normal sentence. Um, instead, she was transferred to a mental state hospital where she would stay indefinitely until she was deemed no longer um, a threat to herself or the general public. And because Isabella was diagnosed um, as schizophrenic, this whole TikTok viral thing with the song Sweet But Psycho playing in the background is just even more disgusting. Isabella was clearly suffering with her mental health at the time of the murder. And I'm not trying to excuse the murder at all, I'm really not, but she was clearly suffering with her mental health. And that is not for the amusement of people on social media. So Isabella has now been in the mental state hospital for around six or seven years. I'm not actually quite sure when she was transferred. So we never really heard from Isabella. Um, since the court appearance. Um, she never ever gave her side of the story. We didn't know anything that went on. The only thing that we ever knew was those viral videos that went viral back in September. And then two months later in November, 2020, Isabella decided to speak publicly for the first time to actually give her side of the story because she did feel like she was ready to rejoin society. I was not myself when I did that. And I have since been restored to full health. I was abused at home by my family for many years. My parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, I left the religion when I was 14 and the abuse at home worsened after I quit. If I could change it or if I could take it back, I would. Stated that she was abused by her family for many years and that the abuse worsened after she decided to leave the Jehovah's Witness religion at the age of 14. There is actually no evidence at all to back up these claims of abuse. However, I did come across a lot of anecdotal stories 
uh, talking about the actual process of leaving the Jehovah's Witness religion and how traumatic it can be in some cases. And when someone does decide to leave the religion, the family and friends surrounding that person are encouraged to disfellowship them and pretty much cut all communication with them. And this can obviously be extremely traumatic for the person leaving the religion. And obviously I just wanna put this out there that there is no evidence at all that this actually did happen to Isabella and she was abused by her family. And obviously it does not justify the horrendous crime that she did commit, but I just thought I should put it out there um, and try and understand maybe a little bit of maybe the mind space that Isabella was in at the time of the murder. I also saw a lot of comments as well saying that if she was being abused, hypothetically, um, she was 18, why didn't she just leave the house? Um, and I just think that that is a very, very naive way of thinking, as if it's just that easy to leave. When you're 18, you're still in school, there was no clear income that Isabella was getting, um, yeah, like she could just leave. Also stated that she deeply regrets what she did. Like she doesn't even recognize that person that she was and she doesn't feel like she is a threat to herself or anyone else and she is ready to rejoin society. Um, and I don't know if she's going to be released um, and rejoin society. Um, I don't know, I couldn't find anything out. But if I just base what I know of other cases where people were found not guilty by reasons of insanity, um, the fact that she's only been in that hospital for six or seven years and she committed murder, um, I don't think she's going to be getting out of the hospital anytime soon. So I think a lot of this case just highlights a lot of the toxic issues there are with social media. When all of these clips started to resurface on TikTok, there was a lot of misinformation being spread. Like in one case, I saw that someone said that her mom was trying to sell Isabella to the mafia and that is why Isabella killed her mom and her mom deserved it. And I was really taken aback when I saw that. I was like, I was like, what? So I tried to do some digging and see if I could actually find any merit to that story. And I couldn't find anything, zero. The only thing that I could find about her mom selling her to the mafia was comments on TikTok videos. And unfortunately, because someone had said it in the comments, that automatically makes it the truth. And a lot of the time in situations like this, uh, people don't really care about what the truth is, but what is just more entertaining. And we all know how information can spread like wildfire and one person only has to say one thing and then everyone believes it and then it gets spread and that's just dangerous. It again highlights the problem of romanticizing murderers, uh, which, wow, don't even get me started on this topic. I mean, I already think that there is an unhealthy obsession with people's appearance on social media. And I feel like it's even more extreme on TikTok. So when you glamorize murderers and then you lift them up because of their appearance, and then you mix it in with a TikTok trend, it's just weird. And also the song Sweet But Psycho being played in the background of all these videos, stigmatizing mental health when we really don't need that. We need to be moving in the right direction. We don't need to be moving backwards. Thank you very much. So that is the story of Isabella Guzman. And I hope that maybe it cleared up some misinformation that you maybe heard about this case on social media. As always, let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments down below. And let me know what other cases you want me to cover because I always wanna know what you want me to do next. And yeah, hope you enjoyed the video. Be nice to people on social media media and don't put an emphasis on people's appearance and don't comment on their mental health. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.